Welcome to UFC Open Mat. We've got a special show lined up for you today where we're taking a look down memory lane of some of the fantastic fights that have happened in the past of which we, as fans and fighters, have dreamt about maybe landing those killer knockout blows. I'm Adam Catterall, Nick Pete with me as ever, and the main man growing that mohawk, getting everybody excited is, of course, Mr. Dan Hardy. Now, listen, Dan, you know the premise for this show. If you pick one of your own fights that you actually did back in the day, then there's going to be trouble. All right. It's got to be somebody <laughs> else's fight, mate. OK, I don't want to relive any of mine. Don't worry. Listen, <laughs> some some of them knockouts, mate, I'd relive them. Uh, you know what I mean? I was yes. looking through the archives and I was actually going to pick one just to uh, just, just to just to big you up even further. But we'll come to Nick first. So for people watching this, and I'm sure you've had this chat with your friends in the pubs and over your social medias and what have you, we are basically going to pick one particular fight, one particular fighter that we would have loved to have lived that particular moment. Nick. Same thing for Dan, right? If if either of yours are Darren Till or Molly McCann, <laughs> you're in trouble, right? It better be something different. If you're if you're coming out to Sweet Caroline at UFC Liverpool, all hell's breaking loose right now, mate. Gary, uh, just just change mine quick, please. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't gone for Darren Till in Liverpool because that would have been too obvious, obviously. But, you know, I do dream about making that walk pretty much every night. Mine is a flashback to UFC 162. And you're probably thinking, UFC 162? Trying to think back through your, through your memory for some iconic moments. Let me tell you. I was in Vegas the entire international fight week. I was there for wow. 10 days in and around this fight. Covered everything about it. It was, of course, Chris Weidman challenging the great the middleweight number one, Anderson Silva, for UFC World Championship gold. And at this point, listen, I was super excited about finally getting to see the GOAT in action live. I'd never seen Anderson fight live before. I was so excited to see him take on Chris Weidman, defending his middleweight title. But I was around Weidman and his team all week at the time. Weidman was sponsored by a brand called Bad Boy. We are, I was working for Fighters Only at the time. We had a great relationship with Bad Boy. We spent a ton of time around all the Bad Boy crew and Weidman and his team in the build-up to the fight. And, you know, heading into fight night, obviously, I'd had them talking to me saying, he's going to do it, he's going to do it. We've built this Anderson Silva defeating machine. He's going to be the new champ. But secretly, I was thinking, ain't anyone going to beat Anderson Silva? He's the GOAT, you know? How can he possibly lose? And to sit ringside for that fight to sit on the front row and watch that happen being around the team as much as I had to see Chris Wyden and achieve his dreams to end the run of Anderson Silva in the manner that he did was absolutely sensational I remember thinking at the time he must feel like the greatest man on earth right now he must <laughs> feel like he's 20 feet tall because he's done the one thing that no man has been able to do he made anderson silver look like a human being and not only that he knocked him out became the middleweight champion and then to, to you know to have drinks with weidman and the team afterwards to just be around the whole thing I remember thinking at the time, wow, imagine being in Chris Weidman's shoes. So as much as UFC Liverpool really <laughs> hit my heartstrings, being Chris Weidman that night ending the run of Anderson Silva, come on, there's few greater moments in all of MMA than that very moment. Dan, that answer would have been different if Darren Till beat Tyron Woodley, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very true, very true. Because <laughs> he was at Dallas as well at that for that particular Absolutely. fight. <laughs> Dan, what have you got for us, mate? Well, <clears throat> the the one that I've picked out, and I've got I've got two because I've got an honourable mention as well. My honourable mention is Masvidal against Askren of course. because oh, of course. there are so, there are so many things about about martial arts that I love, but one thing in particular, the thing that that shines is when someone says they're going to do something, they drill it, they know what they want to do, they've predicted what their opponent's going to do and they nail it, oh. especially when it's so quick. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, like that was great. It was amazing to watch. But then when the video came out of him drilling it and then I got my teeth into it because because I wanted to see why he chose that particular technique. So I went back to the Askren Lawler fight and had a look at that and saw that Askren was level changing in the same direction, in the same same position and everything. I mean, Masvidal set him up perfectly for that shot. Yeah. The, you know, the, there was nothing lucky about it. It was everything was planned and prepared. So that's my honourable mention. The, the other thing which must have been an absolutely overwhelming experience was uh, was Holly Holm facing Ronda Rousey. Wow! Yeah. Oh yes. And that yes. for a lot of reasons. I mean, you know, the size of the venue, 
the the amount of people there, 50 something thousand people. I mean, the, the the conversations that she must have had in her head between the locker room and the and the the octagon because there was so much distance to cover. Yeah. Like that experience must have been surreal. And then you know, Holly coming into this, my memory at the time is that Holly was a decision fighter. She was a good technical striker that's got lots of experience in, in boxing, but had not really found that finishing power necessarily at top level mixed martial arts. And then Ronda, everyone was like, well, at some point she's going to get the arm bar because that's what Ronda does. Yeah. And I mean, and, and again, you know, it was, a, it was a perfect setup, perfect finish. Ronda trying to keep a hold of her arm kept her in range Ooh. turned her back and as she stood up there was a foot ready to ready to meet her chin um and and, and it's the it's the look on holly Holmes' face as well yeah you know look at that i mean it's like to, to go through all of the successes that she had in boxing and then be able to cross over to mixed martial arts and topple what well, the biggest star at the time in the sport was was amazing um that, that must have been quite a quite a surreal experience but probably just as surreal as Chris Weidman knocking out uh, Anderson Silva that must have been very strange as well the difference is with that one Chris Weidman had been training since he first got into mixed martial arts to beat Anderson Silva mm, that's right you know what I mean so it was like that was there was pressure because that was expected of him because that's what he'd been preparing to do mm. yeah whereas like people didn't expect Holly to win because Ronda was just I mean well she, just like Anderson Silva was just unstoppable at the time. Yeah, iconic, iconic. Uh, I really hope that the the producers who obviously put this show together for us on BT Sport use this as the headline um, in the in the YouTube captions. Dan Hardy wants to be Holly Holm. That's what. That's basically what. That's, that's, that's what I hope they use. <laughs> wait till I bleach. Wait till I bleach this blonde. Oh yes, that's, my dreams will be coming true. You'll that's see. That's it, man. Uh, just don't go on TikTok. <laughs> I, don't want to, I don't want to see Dan Hardy dancing on TikTok like I see Holly Holm <laughs> I'll tag you Nick <laughs> the one that I've gone for is obvious really it's Bispin versus Rockhold taking that fight on such short notice as uh, we alluded to in previous programs um, Bispin obviously was on a film set at the time he got the call after Weidman who you've just been speaking about was out this particular fight he gets the call he, uh, he makes way he turns up and don't forget, this was a rematch. He got absolutely battered in the first fight and then lands yeah. left up Larry. Look at that. On two separate occasions to become the first British uh, UFC world champion. A sensational, sensational feat. And the story of Bispin, obviously, with all the nearly times where he was there in the, those eliminators, where he had opportunities and he just fell short. But for him to get the job done, against Luke Rockhold, who we had serious beef with, I just love the narrative of the fight. And to be that guy... Nobody's going to be able to take that away from him ever. No matter what he does with the rest of his life, he was the first guy from these shores to become UFC champion. Yeah. That feeling must have been unbelievable. Oh, amazing, amazing. And, there, there, you know, I'll say, there are three things I like about that fight. First of all, I mean, you could always... There are some people that it's just easy to watch get knocked out, and I don't know why, but Luke Rockhold is one of those kind of people. <laughs> Agreed, absolutely. <laughs> right? That's evil. <laughs> You're evil. So, so for, <laughs> it's true, though. Some it people is. are just easy to watch get knocked out. And absolutely. That's, you know, anyway, so that's the first one. Second of all, as soon as Bisping's won the fight, he runs over to the octagon, as he's running, yeah. you can see Jason Perillo in his corner, his boxing coach, and he just stands up and just folds his arms, like job done. Yeah. Yeah. And then the one other thing that happens in this fight, which I genuinely can't remember happening in any, in any other fight, the winner of the fight, after winning by knockout, runs up and climbs the octagon and then turns and faces their opponent in the octagon and yells at them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Most fighters, they climb up and they jump out and they look at the crowd. Bisping turned back to Rocco, and I won't tell you what he said, yeah. but you can read his lips. <laughs> there, was, there was some Fs, but it was like there that, were some Fs knocking about, yeah. <laughs> there were, there were, there were a couple. But that signifies how much not only winning the belt and winning by knockout meant to Bisping, but getting one back over Rockhold. Yeah. Which, as you said, you know, no one can ever take that away from him. It will be uh, something that he'll be playing, you know, at least once a week for the rest of his life. I would imagine. I would if I was him. Yeah, Bisping literally bit trained his entire life for this moment. But there must have been a time in his career where he was going to bed going, it's never going to happen. That dream is yeah. never going to happen. I've worked my entire life. It's never going to happen. It's just not meant to be for me. Yeah. And for it yeah. to happen the way it did, 13 days notice or whatever it was, it must have just been like a dream for him. He must have woke up with that belt thinking, what the hell has just happened? I mean, I, I was Octagon side for the first one and the, there, was gen there was a feeling that... Bisping has to win this fight if he's ever going to get to a title shot. Mm. Yes. But then at the same time, you're like, oh, well, yeah, but it's Rockhold. Rockhold's very, very good. 
you know, I think Bisping knew that he was really up against it. And then Rockhold's got that kind of, that arrogance around him that just makes losing to him even worse. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and that, you know, <laughs> and Bisping's not very good at dealing with those things as it is. I mean, like you can see me right in there, the, the animosity between the two right there. So that's, that's a social distancing handshake if you've ever seen one. <laughs> before, well before social distancing as well. Sensational. Um, listen, they're the three fights that we've gone for, the moments that we would love to recreate and relive. Uh, as fans and fighters um, please stick a comment in the YouTube section there's loads of stuff there and I'm sure there's fights from uh, yesteryear that you've thought about maybe it's your favourite fighter reaching that peak getting to that moment that you would have loved to have lived yourself put it in there write some explanations and let's have a little bit of fun and start a different type of conversation and make sure you subscribe to our channel here on YouTube for BT Sport because we're constantly churning out content, especially now that fights are back in action too. And we're going to be bringing you more over the forthcoming weeks and we don't want you to miss out on any of that stuff. So make sure you come and join us. We'll catch you next time.